Too often, we hear the great Chinese emperors who made China a global power and a force to be reckoned with. But no one ever talks about the horrors these emperors did to their concubines. The pros of being an imperial concubine? Luxurious clothing, tons of food and meat, and the chance to become an empress of China. The cons? Being a slave under 24-7 supervision, facing execution for the smallest mistake, being separated from your family forever, and the list goes on. Imperial concubines were nothing more than disposable birth givers for the emperor. And heartbreakingly, billions of women went through this harrowing experience. So let's remember them as we explore the brutal life of the Chinese concubines in Imperial China. Concubines have been a crucial part of king's court all over the world, but the concubine culture, if we can call it that, was at its riffest in imperial China. As early as 3,000 years ago, the Zhao dynasty was known to house hundreds, if not thousands, of women inside the court. They were supposed to be intimate with the emperor and provide as many offspring for him as they could, in case the empress couldn't provide a male successor to the throne. Throughout history, the rules around court concubines changed back and forth. Some dynasties put a cap on the number of concubines an emperor can take. In other cases, emperors could buy as many as they wanted to, but even their money was limited. However, there was one emperor that outdid them all. The Hongwu Emperor took his name after he defeated the Mongols and reclaimed China for the Chinese. His real name was Zhu Yangzang. The Hongwu Emperor founded the Ming Empire, which ruled China from 1368 to 1644. The Ming Empire is still considered one of the greatest examples of social stability and orderly governing in history. The Ming Dynasty also sent China into its Golden Age. However, Hongwu obtained this with unspeakable oppression and tyranny. Perhaps the means don't justify the end, but to Hongwu, they did, because his end goal was unlimited power. He established a despotic tradition for the Ming Dynasty, instituting administrative, educational, and military reforms that gave him personal control over all matters of state. Hongwu also gave himself supreme power over all women. In his mind, they were simple commodities. Sadly, this mentality continued for centuries after Hongwu. If the emperor laid eyes on a woman and found her attractive, he would order her family to send her over, and they had no choice but to do so. Only the concubine arrived at the court. She was put in a very specific position. She was inferior to the empress, the emperor's wife, but superior to servants. Nevertheless, concubines were also servants of a different nature, and we must consider that concubine in imperial China translated roughly as slave. So yeah, concubines were there to satisfy the emperor's carnal desires. A Chinese concubine's roles were to please the emperor's polygamous urges and to provide male heirs for him, increasing his chances of maintaining his dynasty. The double standards here are infuriating. The emperor could have as many women as he liked, but the concubines were not even allowed to talk to other men. They were under 24-7 supervision, with court eunuchs assigned to keep their eyes on them at all times. If they were seen striking up a conversation with a man, or worse, flirting with him. The punishment was severe. They could get banished from the court, left homeless and dishonored, or they could get executed. Of course, it was very rare that a man apart from a eunuch was even in the presence of imperial concubines. But concubines could be unalived even if they strayed away from their designated eunuchs. The Hongwu Empire was so possessive of his concubines that he reinstated an ancient rule. When he died, his concubines would be executed too. That's because he wanted their company in the afterlife. In the 1360s, Hongwu constructed the royal palace as well as the Forbidden City. This palace would be the home of the Ming and Qing dynasties, the last two dynasties to rule China before it became a republic. For the empress and emperor, it was a lavish home, but for the emperor's concubines, it was a golden cage, a prison they could never leave. Some emperors had hundreds of concubines, others thousands, and a couple of them had up to 20,000 concubines in the Forbidden City. It was a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Indeed, the concubines were not united in one friendly sisterhood, supporting each other through tough times. Instead, there was a clear hierarchy, with concubines always fighting to go up in rank and pushing others down. The empress was highly respected both inside the court and in all of China. She was seen as the mother of the earth, while the emperor was the father of heaven. While the emperor was a figure to look up to, the empress was the 
one who took care of the population. The only women with power comparable to her, sometimes even greater, was the Empress Dowager, or the Emperor's mother. Under the Empress were the Emperor's consorts, ordered as first consort and two or three others below. These were daughters or high-ranking court officials gifted to the Emperor. Honestly, the word gifted in this context makes my stomach churn. These girls were also there to serve the Emperor's every carnal wish. They were just higher up in rank because of their social status. This experience was not better. Then in the hierarchy came the concubines, and they had a hierarchy of their own. As a concubine, you could always go up or down in rank. Your place was not secured. The main way to stay at the top of the pyramid was by giving birth to a boy. A son meant the emperor had another potential heir to his throne. Again, let us take a quick break to acknowledge how twisted and unfair gender hierarchies are. If the concubine had a daughter, she was still higher up in rank than a concubine who hadn't given birth yet. Some were simply not able to conceive, and others, well, they just didn't have the chance to sleep with the emperor. Remember, there were thousands of concubines they were competing with. The emperor was only human, even though he fashioned himself above humanity. There was another thing concubines did to get to the top, compete with each other. They would play mind games with each other, making it so that the emperor would only see one instead of the other, and even plot other concubines' murders. In some cases, concubines would convince the emperor to have another concubine act it was nothing more than a lie, but it got rid of competition and put the plotting concubine in a trusted position. Perhaps she would even be named Emperor's favorite. In other cases, a group of concubines would attack another concubine, disfiguring her so that the Emperor would have her banished from the Forbidden City. Of course, beauty was the only reason they'd been chosen in the first place, so if you lost your beauty, it was guaranteed you would be kicked out. This is the sad reality of Imperial concubines. They were lonely, even when they were surrounded by thousands of women in the same situation. Imperial concubines were also lonely because they were completely cut off from their families. Sadly, once the emperor set his eyes on a concubine, they'd be taken away, with only a short moment to say farewell to their family. The family couldn't protest. They wouldn't risk getting executed for treason. Imagine being executed for refusing to send your daughter off to be used. And if the concubine decided to sneak out of the court and visit her family, she would also be caught and executed. There was no way out from this life, except if the emperor saw to it. During the Qing dynasty, things got even worse for the poor concubines. Before, all concubines and consorts had access to great luxurious clothing and feasts. Today, it's not strange to have meat in the fridge every single day or eat two or three hearty meals daily. In ancient times, though, poverty was the norm and resources were scarce. Only rich people ate meat every day, and most people settled for small plates of grains and vegetables at every meal. Imperial concubines ate well, to say the least. Each concubine received pounds of red meat, duck, wheat, rice, tea, and the freshest fruit and vegetables in China every single day. You could say that was one of the biggest perks of being a concubine. It was never your choice to become a concubine, but if you were, you would escape poverty and indulge in daily feasts. However, that all changed with the Qing Dynasty. Now the complicated hierarchy remained, but it also dictated what sort of food and clothing the concubines deserved as well as other privileges. With the higher up the concubine, the finer her clothing materials and the more food she received. As you can imagine, this only increased the rivalry. If you're close to starving while someone else can't finish their whole roasted duck, you're bound to have some thoughts about that person. While they waited for the emperor to invite them to his chambers, Chinese concubines spent their days sewing, applying makeup, and making sure they looked perfect. They would learn a certain way to walk, talk, and make gestures. Everything was perfectly rehearsed just like a musical or a classic theater play. The concubines were also often checked by eunuchs and the empress dowager's maids. They were bathed and observed in great detail, so as to make sure they were perfect at any given moment, just in case they were called to the imperial chambers. But some concubines never made it to the emperor's room. There were simply too many women to choose from, so some went their entire lives preparing for a moment that never came. Meanwhile, they never made any friends and plotted against other concubines, hoping they would once become favorites or empresses. Imagine spending all your life around a false hope and knowing you could have enjoyed friendship and peace in a different life. 
Outside contact was also frowned upon for concubines, that if they got sick, a doctor couldn't visit. Instead, their designated eunuch would describe their illness to a physician, who would in turn recommend a treatment. But of course, this was an ineffective telephone game. Many times, the treatment would not be right, and the concubine would succumb to her illness. When a concubine grew old, sometimes the emperor would decide she was unattractive. In the luckiest cases, she would be sent back to her family with a hefty pension. Even so, if she was old, her parents would most likely be gone at this point. In not-so-lucky cases, the elderly concubines would be gifted to other kings in China to serve the same purpose. There are very few cases of concubines escaping the Forbidden City. Indeed, some made a run for it, but it was no easy feat. It's not like they could have walked out the front gates. There would have been a lot of sneaking, climbing, and risky jumping. Also, if they ever got caught on the outside, they would be executed on the spot. So they had to live the rest of their lives in hiding, possibly wearing disguise. Disguises. However, there were still a few concubines who got a lucky break. Empress Wu Zetian started out as a concubine for Emperor Taizong. She was 25 years old when the emperor passed away. Zigong was not like Hong Wu. When he died, there was no rule saying the concubine had to go with him. Instead, they were supposed to be shipped off to a monastery to live the rest of their lives as nuns. Wu Zetian, however, managed to woo the successor Gao Zong. In a few decades, Wu became the emperor's wife. At the age of 66, she became became sovereign of the entirety of China. Then there was the Despo Sixi. She was the favorite concubine of the Emperor Zhang Feng. When Zhang Feng died, her five-year-old son was the only viable successor. But in 1861, Sixi organized a coup and ensured the son stayed in her care. She continued to live her life as Empress Dowager and indulged in all the hedonism you can imagine. But when the Opium Wars ravaged China, she did almost nothing to stop them. So we're talking about the 1800s. Indeed, China was ruled by dynasties for thousands of years up to 1912 when it became the Republic of China. In 1949, it became the Communist People's Republic of China. So how many concubines have passed through imperial courtyards in two millennia? And how many made it to Empress? You do the math. Billions of concubines lived in a lonely, unfair life, subjected to the selfish desires of powerful men. Some died at their hands too. Perhaps the saddest part is that they had zero choice about their life. They were handpicked like fruit by men working for the emperor. They were treated as disposable birth givers and put under tremendous amounts of pressure. They could not afford to make one mistake or they would lose their head. The emperor, however, made a lot of mistakes and hardly ever paid a price. We can be thankful the days of the concubines are over. Hey, thanks for watching. What are your thoughts on Chinese concubines and other imperial customs? Let me know in a comment. And before you go, make sure you like and subscribe. See you next time.